<laughs> you want me to go ahead and share my screen now? Uh, you can um, share your screen, sir, and uh, you'll have to also have to hide your annotations. Uh, sometimes people start scribbling a little bit. No problem. Yeah, and um, we'll start. So we welcome you all to, to the today's lockdown lecture. Um, we have our uh, speaker, Dr. David Chang, who's an internationally recognized cataract subspecialist. He serves on the medical advisory board of several global humanitarian organizations. And he has taught cataract surgery to ophthalmology residents in training for 25 years. He has designed a number of popular cataract surgical instruments. So we are here today to learn from his expertise. Um, we welcome you, sir. Over to you for your talk on toric IOLs. Okay, very good. Well, uh, good, after good evening, everybody. It's morning here. Um, I am just going to uh, get started here. Uh, of course, around the world, toric lenses are sort of the most popular refractive lens implant. They certainly are here in the United States and I believe in India. Uh, so this is toric monofocal, but it could be also toric presbyopia correcting. And um, this is a little bit more of an advanced course that uh, I'll try to give today. And really, you know, what are some of the challenges for us? as cataract surgeons. Um, I'm just gonna check, you can, all, you can see my screen, correct? Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, so we'll start with, of course, uh, the, some of the population data, which shows that really a substantial number of people uh, can benefit from toric lenses. So if you look at uh, greater than or equal to a diopter, that's more than a third of our patients. And you would argue that at least 8% who have more than two diopters would, you know, really should be offered this option if they're a private pay a patient because it's an affordable option. Uh, and uh, it's simply a matter of giving the patient the uh, option that they can decide whether it's of value to them. Now, why are toric lenses so popular? Because we can do astigmatic keratotomy. But the biggest variables with astigmatic keratotomy are the individual corneal stiffness, what we call hysteresis. And this is why a younger patient, you don't get much effect. And yet an over pa uh, older patient, you can overcorrect very quickly because that cornea is so stiff. So it's really not something solved by the femtosecond laser. Uh, and it's not the length, it's not even the depth, it's the stiffness of the cornea that makes it so variable. And then the other thing is that the effect can regress over time as that incision heals. So a toric lens has those advantages, but we do have to select, of course, the proper axis uh, preoperatively. We also have to come up with the right amount of cylinder. We then have to surgically align it properly and then maintain that alignment so it doesn't rotate postoperatively. Um, so it forces us to do some different things. So preoperatively, uh, keratometry alone is probably not enough. We really wanna know the nature of the astigmatism and that's why you, we do topography. Uh, you can still use a toric lens if you have slightly irregular astigmatism. So either uh, mild keratoconus, uh, or maybe a marginal um, uh, ectasia, Saltzman's. Uh, anytime that the patient is not going to wear a rigid contact lens and they're going to wear glasses, well, if you're going to put astigmatism in a lens, such as a spectacle lens, you can still put it in the uh, IOL. Uh, you're just basically saying this patient is not going to address their irregular cornea with a rigid contact lens. So we're going to do a best fit astigmatism uh, correction. Uh, and of course, we have to do the calculation. And many people nowadays do use TORA calculators, uh, and they're built into the biometer in many cases. Now, intraoperatively, uh, we have to 
uh, select the toric lens design and material. We've got to somehow mark the axis and then reposition it there. Uh, how do we measure the corneal curvature preoperatively? We, we have a number of different options, uh, and uh, some people do multiple options, but which of these is the best was addressed in this paper in 2015 by Adi Abulafia and uh, the Baylor group and a lot of other people that all participated to, to this database. And what they found was that compared to the uh, Zeiss Humphrey Atlas topographer, that the keratometry function from the two most common biometers in the US, the LENSTAR and the IOL master, actually were better. Uh, so it's saying that uh, these sort of, and these are now the updated versions, the, the, the uh, 700 for IOL master, the 900 for LENSTAR. Uh, these keratometry functions now have improved so much, you don't really need uh, to do anything else to determine the axis. As I say, I still, do think everyone, if possible, should look at topography to assess the, uh, the regularity of that cornea, because uh, if it's irregular, you need to tell the patient, don't you? Just like if there's a epiretinal membrane, you tell the refractive IOL patient, hey, you know, you have a second problem that my cataract surgery won't fix. And instead of an A, you might get a B plus for your vision afterwards. And same thing, if you look at the cornea and you say the quality of the cornea isn't as good, they have basement membrane disease, a chronic dry eye, okay, you don't put in a multifocal in that patient, but you would still want to tell them, you know, you have a very um, uh, a irregular shape to your cornea because you previously had LASIK or you have a very dry eye. And the cataract surgery won't fix that when you're vision won't be as good as someone who has a perfect cornea. So for example, here's a topography where we can see it's a little steeper above. It probably isn't going to affect that patient too much, uh, but I might mention and show them the picture. Uh, and here uh, in this, uh, I know that you have the Tracy in, in some areas. You can look at the SIMK and that says two diopters, but the SIMK is really just looking at this three millimeter ring here. And so you're really just measuring the astigmatism uh, in that circular ring, whereas the refractive power is measuring all of the curve in the middle. So what that means is it, instead of just the ring here, the ray tracing points that go through the middle uh, and that is why the refractive power function is better uh, than the, uh, the, uh, the SIMK. Uh, wavefront aberometry goes back to what I was uh, saying before, and that is, you know, you don't want to see, here's the aberometry, the higher order aberrations of the cornea that's available with the ray trace, and you want as few bars as possible. And here you see there's a lot of coma and trefoil and that's because this is a post-LASIK eye. You see that it's not quite centered uh, here, the, uh, the, the flattening. And so there's, a, there's some irregular astigmatism that is highly pupil dependent. If the patient is a very small pupil, perhaps they're elderly, uh, it's not gonna matter as much, but in someone who has a larger pupil, and here this patient without dilating drops, their pupil is five millimeters, well, that means more of the cornea is exposed, and this type of aberration, which doesn't look too bad, will be significant with the, uh, the coma. So um, this is one thing that I do not, I would say probably most American surgeons do not, but these are sort of some of the things that we, um, you know, uh, look at in a refractive uh, patient. Now, Doug Koch uh, and Baylor, uh, pretty much uh, uh, confused everything for us by teaching us that we really had to factor in posterior corneal astigmatism. All the things we've looked at so far are measuring the anterior corneal curvature and posterior corneal astigmatism is basically um, something that we don't ordinarily measure. And there are different ways that you can try to measure this. Uh, you can use a shine fluke uh, camera 
Uh, a swept source OCT can do this, or in some cases, light LED reflections. Uh, so, gee, do we have to get one of these machines? Well, this Portuguese um, study published in 2017, I'm glad they published it because they looked at different ways to measure posterior corneal astigmatism, and they looked at different formulas. And what they found was if you just, even if you don't measure the posterior case, if you just use the Barrett formula, which uh, uses a theoretical calculation of the posterior corneal curvature, you will do just fine. And so this is saying use the Barrett formula uh, and you do not need to directly measure the uh, posterior cornea. Uh, where can you get this? You can get it online, the apacrs.org uh, or the ascrs.org websites will let you in for free. But all of the major calculators now the Alcon and the J&J &J incorporate the Barrett formula. They used to not incorporate it. And at those points, the formulas uh, were not as good. And now again, with our biometers, if we use a LensStar or an IOL master, the latest versions, the software will immediately print out the lens you want using the Barrett formula. Uh, just to give you an example, the Hagus printout on the right says, I have a diopter against the roll. So that would be a, a, a plus. Yes, hello. Um, there is a central box which is uh, coming in gray. Yeah, all right. Let me uh, see if I can close that. Okay, did that help? So you're really seeing everything on my screen. Got it. Yeah, okay, so here's. The bottom box is, again, it has gone to the. Yeah, let me see how I can move that. Um, let's see if I can just... Uh, probably put it down here. It, I'm not sure how to make that disappear. Okay. I, I, it eventually, um, so I'll just move it here. So you can see that um, using the Hagus formula, uh, it would pre predict a uh, ZCT 150 or a T3. Uh, whereas with the Barrett formula, it predicts the next highest uh, power. And that's because it's adding the posterior corneal astigmatism uh, into the calculation. Let's see if I move this down now. Okay. All right. So the, uh, the latest IOL master uh, has incorporated what they call total keratometry. And this is an effort to estimate the posterior corneal astigmatism by actual measurements. And how does it do this? Well, uh, you basically have OCT, swept source OCT with this biometer. And not only can you get a good measurement of the axial length and the lens thickness, you can measure the corneal thickness. And so using the uh, telecentric keratometry, and you can map the curvature of the cornea, you subtract the thickness of the corneas measured by swept source OCT, and you can derive and extrapolate the posterior corneal curvature. And when you add the two together, it's called total keratometry, and then that is plugged into the formulas. So now I have a choice in yellow as the anterior keratometry, in green is the total a keratometry, which incorporates the measurement of the posterior cornea. So here is an example of a Barrett with this new, and, and you see it says the delta K is 1.18. That's the difference between the steep and the flatter corneal curvature. But then I see in green, the 1.43, that's the total K, which is incorporating the measurement of the posterior cornea. And you can see then that it, even though it's a diopter against the rule of corneal, anterocorneal astigmatism, I need to use 
a T4 or a ZCT225. You see that because it's adding that. So does this really help? Uh, it's still relatively new in the sense of no one's done a huge study, but I will tell you that Graham Barrett has studied this. And even though this is a direct, a more direct measurement of the posterior corneal curvature, he says that his traditional Barrett formula that estimates the, the theoretical value of the posterior K is actually more accurate. And then, and so it, it really, I wouldn't buy the machine just for that. All right, now we get into the surgery. And of course we have to mark the cornea. And if you think about, you know, what we have to do to get that toric lens correct, think about the errors that can be introduced along the way, starting with what if the patient, when they're having their keratometry, tilts their head? Well, that's not something the surgeon sees, only the technician. So the technician plays a very important role. Then we have to transfer the data from the office to the OR. We can make mistakes there. We have to make sure the patient is sitting up so that we don't have cyclotorsion when we mark them. We then have to identify it in the office and, and sort of find re relative to the reference marks uh, where to make our toric axis. And then we have to have our pen marks be accurate and they, they can be, of course, inaccurate and they can fade. So I highlighted in red, which I think are the most likely uh, problems to occur. Now, this is an article that appeared in September 2017 in Ophthalmology, but it's a correspondence. It was not a major article. A lot of people overlooked it. And I think it's a really fascinating uh, study for us that do toric lenses from Japan. And they did 72 consecutive monofocal technus torus. They used a slit lamp, uh, much as you do, and much as you do, they made ink marks uh, at the slit lamp. And what they did is then they took digital photos after surgery to check the lens alignment. But you can see that what was unusual is they did the photographs immediately after surgery and then one hour after surgery and then the traditional day one and month one. And they kept going after three months and one year in these 72 eyes. So they checked the alignment at more points than we would do clinically. And if you look at the net mean error. So for the 72, the mean error was between six and seven degrees at a year, long-term follow-up. And this is how it's usually expressed as a mean with a standard deviation. Well, it turns out that 20% of that error was actually due to surgical alignment. In other words, they thought they were aligning it at 175. They sat the patient up, took a picture, and it might have been 172. Um, another 61% of that error at one year in terms of alignment occurred due to rotation within the first hour. In other words, between the photo immediately after surgery and taking one hour, the lens had turned. And what happens during that hour is, of course, the patient kind of sitting up further, they're walking out, you know, out of the operating room, et cetera moving around a little bit, looking around the room, making saccades with their eye. So between one hour and one year, the entire follow-up that we're aware of, that was only 11% of the error. So everything else happened before we start even uh, doing the first check. So it says that when there is rotation, 85% of that occurs in the first hour. And that's why if we, uh, as long as we look at that um, lens at two weeks or a month, it's probably not going to rotate. But it also means that if we see the patient back, as many of us do in the United States, even that same day, because they have a long drive to our office and we may see them six hours after surgery that same day in the office, uh, it's probably not going to move from that point, And that's helpful. And here's two studies then that show that, you know, uh, and these are using digital alignment with the Callisto that showed that digital alignment does help because surgical misalignment uh, is an issue. And as uh, you have Varion, uh, that's another way to do uh, digital alignment. And then this is the Callisto. Um, what we like about the Callisto, but they all work similarly, is that 
when you're doing, there's a camera built in that takes this black, this uh, image of the Limbus, and this is the operator screen, and it's just one more function after keratometry and AC depth and white to white that it does. So uh, we have the, uh, this computer attached to the uh, Zeiss microscope. The computer is called Callisto, and we bring the image and input it into the computer. Um, and here's the limbal image in the upper left. We input it for that patient. And then the live image from the microscope is registered to this black and white image obtained in the clinic. And we get the reference marks. And you can see that the 180 axis will show up as a yellow line. And then I input what axis I want, in this case, 90 degrees. Uh, and that shows up there. Now, how fast does this take? So this is the circulating nurse, and that's all it is. Uh, she basically pushes a button, and then she shows me the yellow line. The um, paint, the red is my uh, reticle for the aura, the intraoperative wavefront aberrometry. And now my microscope is lined up at 180. Now, this is what I see as the surgeon. I just see the line appear, and then uh, I put my reticle on, and then I'm lined up. And then with my foot pedal, I can then change the overlay, the digital overlay. There's the capsulotomy guide. It's a five millimeter axis. And there's my axis, which looks like it's about 15 degrees. And then after I turn it off and do the surgery, and I can operate this with my foot pedal. And then when I'm ready to, I activate it with my foot pedal and there's the 15 degree uh, alignment. And I zoom up and I can tell that it's there. It's interesting when you use ink marks, you tend to zoom backwards because you have to dr mentally draw a, an imaginary line connecting the two ink dots. Whereas with the uh, digital, you zoom up so you can really see how they are. And you can see here, I'm leaving the eye a little bit soft. And this is just showing uh, the limbal image that I've turned on its side. And you can see the vessels there and the vessel, I, I guess you're seeing the bar, you see the vessels that match up there and how it's done. So when I first uh, got this, you know, in the very beginning, you don't trust it. So you still do your ink marks as well. And so I'm just showing some cases that show that, you know, I, you know, I was just doing ink marks where the patient was sitting up in their uh, operating bed before uh, they got laid down. And you can see that sometimes it was off by as much as almost five degrees uh, with that. Um, we still use intraoperative aberrometry. The main value is uh, after the lens is put in, because sometimes preoperatively, you're not sure uh, is the axis 165 or 170, because different machines give you a different answer. Or with a lower power, uh, like a T3 or a ZCT150, um, you know, sometimes uh, it, that lower power, that lower amount of astigmatism, hard to detect, particularly if, uh, you know, the anterior cornea only has uh, 0.75, you know, and it's because of the posterior corneal addition that I'm using a T3. So if there's only 0.75 difference on the anterior cornea, um, different machines on different days and depending on the wetting of the cornea can be a little different. So intraoperative aberrometry lets me try out different positions of the lens and get a live refraction to see uh, which is the best. And NRR, no rotation recommended, means that I've got the best fit uh, for that eye. So uh, you can use intraoperative aberrometry when the eye is aphakic, uh, and it's basically a virgin's formula like any other formula, but it incorporates the aphakic refraction. But, um, and theoretically, you know, it should take into account posterior corneal astigmatism. But as I say, the alignment uh, in the pseudophakic toric IOL eye uh, is really helpful. And if you didn't have Callisto, a lot of Americans use aberrometry, and it helps them realize that it's, the lens was misaligned. Maybe that's due to uh, the marks. Uh, and so that's the theoretical advantage. So I'm going to shift to talking about pearls for avoiding rotation. 
Um, and here are my six pearls. Uh, use, don't use a dispersive viscoelastic. Uh, I do remove it behind the lens because I want the lens to contact the posterior capsule. Um, if you have it uh, and it's available, I use digital alignment. I tend to put the, the IOL on the nasal part of the capsular bag because the visual axis tends to be nasal. Um, and that it, but it also causes a little more compression of the haptic and I think a little more contact. And then don't overfill the eye because if you do, it tends to preferentially inflate the bag and that can induce a rotation early on. And based on that Inui study that I showed you, I tell the patient not to do too much uh, walking, do a lot of sitting and reading or television on the day. Um, so here is a symphony toric on the top, a restore toric in the bottom. And you know, with diffractive lenses, we want to align them on the visual axis. So uh, this makes it pretty much sit in the nasal part of the bag. Um, and so now I have to also align the astigmatism. But I do this for the monofocals now also, because I think when you push the lens into the, the corner up against the capsular fornix, you get a little more contact initially so that there's a little broader contact of the haptic and not just simply the two point uh, haptic there. And you'll see that both cases, uh, the eye was kind of soft when I touched it. And so here's the two uh, toric uh, restores. You can see they're decentered on the uh, bag, but centered on the visual axis. Same thing with the symphony to center it on the visual axis. You can see that it sits a little bit nasally. So my partner and I uh, published this study in ophthalmology, and uh, it's about a year and a half uh, where we had 1,273 consecutive eyes. Uh, so this was every toric, monofocal toric that we did during those year and a half. And it worked out that about half were the Acrosoft from Alcon and half were the Technos from J&J. &J. Um, what was important is this was the very first study in the literature and still the only one in the literature where every single case had digital alignment using the Callisto. We, we did Aura, that wasn't so important, but the digital alignment is, and why? Because the digital alignment assured that it was properly aligned on the operating table. So any misalignment that we saw postoperatively, we could tell was due to rotation. So even the FDA studies, which show the misalignment rate of whatever, you know, four degrees average, on the Acrosoft Toric or the FDA study for the J&J &J Toric, they just report misalignment. You don't know how much of that was rotation of the lens or was it surgically misaligned to begin with, as we said. So that's the importance of the digital alignment for this study. And so when you compare the lower power and the higher power, you can see that it's about the same in the two groups. It wasn't like we tended to use the Acrosoft when they had high power lenses. Um, and as I say, all of them had Callisto. So the differences were at every single, whether you look at within five, 10 or 15 degrees of the target axis, the Acrosoft was always better. The Technus had a tendency to rotate more. And if you look at five degrees up here at the top, uh, the difference, 92%, 82%, that's a pretty large difference, right? Uh, plus or minus, you know, within five degrees means you had to hit a landing zone of a, a 10 degree landing zone, right? Plus or minus five. So a 10 degree landing zone. And that meant that 20%, almost one out of five of the Technus Torix didn't hit the landing zone. And for Acrosoft, it was one out of five. So we're not still not as good as we would like to be. Um, if you look at how many were more than 10 degrees and why did we pick 10 degrees? Well, when you're 10 degrees off, you lose about a third of the astigmatism correcting effect of a toric lens. That's just the math mathematics of the vectors. So uh, it was uh, three times more often the technus was rotating more than 10 degrees. That means it was not at or less than 10 degrees. It was greater than 10 degrees. And usually it would be 15 or more. Um, the Acrosoft was 2.2 and that was highly significant. Now, not everybody um, 
would would have rotation because you may decide uh, you know, I don't think it's a low power lens. It's only 15 degrees. Uh, this patient, you know, lives far away. They're happy. I'm not going to even bother to rotate it. Or some people, you think they'll really be benefit by rotation, but they don't want to. Maybe they're afraid or, you know, it's too inconvenient or they're just happy the way their vision is. So the ro repositioning rate here will always underestimate the rotation rate. And three, even though we, we did twice as many rotations, it didn't reach statistical significance in these numbers that we were doing them. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look at on the left-hand side, this is the technus. And this showed um, the, how much rotation you got, whether the lens started at 180 against the roll or at 90 with the roll or obliquely in between. And you can see that the misalignments were always in the same direction. This lens always rotates counterclockwise. Uh, it didn't rotate clockwise hardly at all. Well, let's look at the Acrosoft in blue. Um, you see there wasn't that much rotation, but when there was, it was when the lens started with the roll. So all of our Acrosofts had the, the rotation that were when they were with the rule or uh, at axis 90. So, you know, if the bag was big or you, you made a lens that was too small, um, you, you know, or a plate haptic lens that was too small, you would expect the lens would be, you know, 50-50 between counterclockwise and clockwise. So to have these differences, it's telling you there's something very different about the platform architecture or maybe the material or something that's causing this difference in lens behavior. It's not purely random. So when we published this in ophthalmology, uh, you know, both eyes had good outcomes. We said the stability was better with the Acrosoft. The technus rotated counterclockwise, and we wondered if maybe the haptics were stiffer. They're a little more rigid. Uh, and uh, it wasn't statistically uh, significant, but we had to reposition the technus more often. Well, what happens when you con continue that study beyond those 18 months? Well, we did that uh, because shortly after that study, the TORIC version of the Restore and the TORIC version of the Symphony, which is an extended depth of focus diffractive IOL we have in the U.S., it's around the world, really. They got introduced. So at last year's AAO meeting, um, my partner presented our paper, which was uh, accepted. And we simply took from, you know, September and kept it going to capture uh, not only more toric monofocals, but the toric symphonies, which we were using a lot of, okay, almost 800. And we didn't use the restore very much. So we didn't basically use that many toric restores either. We were tending at that phase to put in a lot of symphonies. But this now, again, captures every consecutive monofocal and presbyopia correcting toric lens that we put in during that period of um, about four years. And here are the results. So Restore is in purple, Symphony is in red, and um, I'm looking at percent that were within five or within 10 or 15 degrees of the axis. In parentheses, I put the number for the monofocal that we got, and uh, otherwise it's the presbyopia correcting toric. And what you can see is that even though, you know, the numbers were a little small for the Restore, but it was very similar. And also with the symphony, it was quite similar. Uh, in fact, the rotation, the number that rotated, um, well, yeah, we, so the symphony was, was really quite similar as well. So you would expect that, right? Because it's the same platform, but this showed that uh, putting that diffractive rings on the optic didn't really affect the rotation rate. Um, so again, uh, this is the monofocal uh, there. So let's look at how many rotated 10 more than 10 degrees. 
uh, these were um, so you can see that the symphony we had actually more numbers and so we we probably had more rotation so out of 779 again in parentheses i'm putting the monofocal rate uh the restore okay the zero is probably because the numbers were too small but now we know from uh it was 2.2 so we had again that same three times 3x multiple once again we had um misalignment more than 10 degrees three times more often with the j and j platform but the repositioning rate was much higher it was seven percent that was very high so think about why that was well finally now it was highly significant so let's look at repositioning how many cases had repositioning comparing the technus and the acrosoft and here is the premium iols here so we had four out of 84 18 out of um oh, I'm, I'm sorry I, um so this was just on the monofocals now so this was the first study that you saw that's published and by extending our study we added 84 technus torics and 1700 acrosoft torics so now I can tell you more about the monofocal torque because we have bigger numbers. Uh, so it's about three and a half percent versus 1.2 percent. So three times as often, we actually had to rotate the monofocal technus, and that this time is statistically significant. Okay, so this was what was published. This is the additional data, and this is our best bet. So we know the Acrosoft is about 1.2%, three times higher with the Technus. With the EDOF or the multifocal, the repositioning rate was twice that of the monofocal. And the reason for this is when your patient is um, paying extra for a presbyopic correcting lens, um, <clears throat> they're expecting better vision, not just in the distance, but at multiple ranges, including intermediate or near. And the residual astigmatism has a much more deleterious effect uh, in those patients. So this simply reflected that we had to or were more aggressive about residual astigmatism in offering rotation. And the patient was more motivated because they were more unhappy with the same amount of rotation uh, in the uh, presbyopia correcting lens. So you can see that um, the Symphony, um, uh, so the, uh, the technus monofocal toric rotated three times more frequently than the acrosoft, but the symphony rotated twice as more as the monofocal in terms of repositioning, needing repositioning. Okay, and that's a pretty high number now. That's 54 repositionings. So when you add up all of our repositionings here, you know, we're getting uh, closer to 75. And fortunately, we can say out of that 75, we did not have any complications since this capsule rupture. So we shared this data with J&J &J after our first study. And they spent um, two and a half years trying to figure out how to get their toric to rotate less, because this is a serious problem, especially when you add it to a premium lens. And they tried many different variations. And the one that they, uh, and, and then they tried combinations and they tested this in vitro. And what, what they did is, this is the original technus, toric, monofocal. You can see that the outer edge of the haptic, the peripheral outer edge is smooth. And they found that when you make it rough, then you don't, it doesn't rotate. And so that is the change that came out and, and the, this is their version two. So everywhere in the world, because of our study and what they found is they've now replaced the haptic um, on the monofocal toric. And when the new generation of symphony comes out, uh, probably this summer, it will feature this uh, haptic. Uh, so this is, uh, and it's kind of interesting 
you know, how, how do you make the outer edge rough? This is very similar to uh, what we found we had to do to your PMMA um, Aura Lab lens to get the square edge. And that is you don't polish uh, that square edge. Uh, and in this case, the lens is tumble polished. How do you not polish the haptic? Well, they put little, small, little uh, socks on the haptic to cover it up. So when the lens is polished, that, that haptic doesn't get polished. So that's the, uh, the change that they've had. Um, so Dr. Harapriya uh, and I are uh, almost ready to submit um, this study from uh, your Madurai uh, institution. Uh, on a comparison of hydrophilic and hydrophobic torax. I think this is really an important study because, you know, um, the toric lenses in most countries, the patient pays extra for it, but the cost of the American made Acrosoft and J&J &J are just so high in the economy of uh, many other countries that they're just simply not affordable. So hydrophilic torax give uh, uh, pa patients in those countries uh, something that is more affordable that they'll still choose to pay extra for. Uh, but there's really no data in the literature on that we found. And so uh, you can see here that 125 uh, total out of uh, 5,500 uh, required repositioning. And that's because they were rotated at 15 degrees or more off. And uh, again, about three quarters of those patients actually went and had the repositioning. Uh, but if you compare the rates between the hydrophilic and red, hydrophobic, which is the Acrosoft, uh, it was 1.5. And the rate of actual repositioning was 1.3. And you just saw in my large series the rate was 1.2 in repositioning. So you can see how consistent uh, that is. So a little bit more often with the hydrophilic, but none of these met statistical significance. So, you know, uh, that would be kind of one question to ponder is if it was uh, too often, uh, uh, you know, it, would, it, would it make sense to make the edge of the haptic uh, rougher somehow? I'm not sure how that would be done. Uh, this is something we've started to do in the United States, and, and I've been doing this since October. I've now done 90 uh, adjustable, light adjustable lenses. And uh, so this is from RX site. It's a silicone three-piece lens, and it has molecules that can diffuse around. Uh, when you shine a wavelength of UV light, they polymerize. And uh, once they're polymer polymerized, they're consumed, so the free floating molecules now have a diffusion gradient. And so after shining light on the middle of the lens, these molecules are consumed. So the other molecules from the periphery move toward the center to diffuse, it makes the center thicker and it creates uh, a little myopic shift. And then when you lock it in, the lens becomes like every other three piece monofocal, a permanently fixated lens. It's only available in a monofocal this is the device we do it in the office. It's not a laser, it's a UV exposure. So there's no cutting and you can uh, move uh, two diopters in either direction and correct. Really actually you can almost get up to four and a half diopters with repeat uh, treatments. Um, why is this? Uh, I think one of the ultimate ways, it's, uh, it's very expensive uh, in the sense that we charge the most for it, but now it doesn't matter whether you took it posterior corneal astigmatism, surgically induced astigmatism into account. Uh, if the cornea is a little regular, doesn't matter. You refract them and put cylinder in their glasses. We're just gonna put it back in the lens uh, and it avoids the, the regression of uh, an AK. And finally, we have guaranteed no toric lens rotation because we're gonna do this uh, and start changing at three or, uh, or four weeks uh, after the surgery. So that's sort of the ultimate. So we just do FACO the standard way, then we refract them. And whether you wanna start changing it two, three or four weeks, uh, we do this adjustment in the office. So they have now a customized 
monofocal lens where both the toric power and axis and the spherical power have all been uh, uh, optimized and customized. I know we have um, uh, 10 minutes, so I'm going to start talking a little bit about some cases for repositioning, okay? So here's a patient on Flomax, and he has two cataracts uh, with some cylinder. And you can see it's oblique cylinder. So I'm going to use a Symphony Toric, and it's a 225 power at axis 40 for the right eye. So he comes in after surgery, and he's 2040, but he's not happy. And I, his refraction, he's got a diopter and a half of cylinder. So as I said, it's critical to have as little cylinder as possible when you have a diffractive uh, extended depth of focus or multifocal lens. And that's because the lens is rotated. Instead of being oblique at 40, it's at 180. And so the first thing you do is you, you do the refraction. I'll repeat the topography to make sure I have another chance to get a new fresh topography. And uh, it's the same. And so then we, I know that uh, at Madurai, you're using the eye trace. Um, uh, what we use is this online calculator. You go to astigmatismfix.com and uh, it's very easy to use. It's online, it's free, and you just put in uh, the current refraction uh, and the current lens. Uh, and what it does is it tells you, okay, your current lens is at 180. Um, given the post-op refraction, it should be at 34. And you remember I had selected 40. Uh, it also has this nice feature where you see this is the current refraction and it says if you were to rotate it to 34, this is what the refraction would be that you'd expect. And you get, you go from, we got rid of a diopter of astigmatism. So um, I took her back and this is at two weeks out. Uh, now I'm going through the same incisions and I am choosing not to put in viscoelastic because I don't want to make the lens slippery and I don't want the bag to be really dilated. And if I'm going in with the symphony at about two weeks, um, it's gonna be freely mobile and I can still rotate it like this at a month without putting in viscoelastic. And I'm injecting with my, this cannula is on a syringe that has BSS and I'm just injecting as I need to. So it's topical, there's no viscoelastic. And as long as I keep inflating, I'm not going to tear the capsular bag or dehiss it. And here I'm using my Callisto or, or however you want to mark it. And it's quite easy. So it's fast. We still do it in the operating room. We don't charge uh, the patient. Uh, and uh, I push that optic haptic junction. Uh, and because I haven't used viscoelastic and I haven't really redilated the capsular bag, uh, it's pretty taut and the lens won't rotate again. Um, so here is uh, the pre-op and I'm showing the left eye because I did them at the same time. I was able to tell the patient, you know, I know you're not happy, but all I have to do is turn the lens and you're gonna be seeing much better. And you can even give them a trial refraction to correct their cylinder so they can see how much their distance vision improves just to show them. So you can see that um, when I did the left eye, I added a capsule tension ring because the first eye had rotated. And then after I did that eye, I just simply went to the other eye and did the rotation on the same trip. So there was minimal inconvenience to the patient. And this is the refractive result afterwards. Uh, and you can see they were happy. So uh, that, Ability to show them uh, what would happen if you rotate it, uh, convince this person to go ahead and have their other eye with the same uh, lens. So these are some of the things that we talked about uh, that I do it coincident with the uh, left eye. Let's show another case. Um, here, the intent, this is um, a, uh, a, another symphony, but it's a high power, it's a 300 power. And you can see that I'm pretty close. So um, I wanted to be at 85. It rotated 10 degrees 
most people would not touch this because 10 degrees, remember, is pretty good. But the post-op refraction, they have residual cylinder. Remember, uh, 10 degrees, we lose about a third of the correcting effect. So this says that if I rotated it, I could get it even close to zero. Um, and so would, the question is, would you take this patient back? They are happy already. They're not unhappy because you can tell that uh, they're 2040 and J8. They're not unhappy. Would you rotate it? Well, I'm a, you know, I think uh, I decided I would. And so when I did the other eye, um, you know, this is the left eye needed surgery. So this is just showing me doing the second eye now. And remember, it rotated 10 degrees. It's a high power. So I'm going to put in a capsule tension ring. And then I aligned it. And then I turned around. And here's the second eye, the, the first eye that I had done. And remember, it's just 10 degrees off. And so I just need to rotate it 10 degrees clockwise. Now, this is five weeks after. You see, it's a little different. It's a little, it's definitely um, more adherent to the capsule or the capsule's more adherent to it. So I have to nudge it a little more to break the adhesions. Um, if I really, uh, if it was months later, I would need viscoelastic. But this is just showing that even at four to six weeks, um, I'm able to, uh, you know, break the adhesion. The Acrosoft has that um, bulb at the end of the tip. And because of that, it becomes harder to rotate at an earlier stage. So you have to, it, it will be harder to rotate if you wait too long. And I still leave them uh, a little soft here. Uh, so this is showing the two eyes the first right eye on the top and how they're aligned. Um, I'm gonna skip, I'll just show you maybe um, one last case here. And, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I meant to show you the follow-up. So this is the follow-up of the, the patient that you just saw. You can see that the right eye, you know, the, you know, she was happy because it's 2040, but that 2040 J8 improved to 2025 plus J4 just with that 10 degree of rotation. And the left eye ended up a little myopic. Uh, and I was trying to have the left eye be slightly myopic because with the symphony, you can get a little better near if you make them slightly myopic. She ended up more myopic than I wanted, but she was happy because she was so myopic to begin with, even though this was not a good job of selecting the lens power. But at least it stayed on axis and I didn't have residual astigmatism. All right. Um, this is a 53-year-old, again, a high myope. Uh, and this is showing that this uh, lens rotated. Look how much they're a high myope now. And it's a 225. I put it in at, at axis 90 and it rotated 180 degrees. And so this is showing me going back at a week because when you rotate the lens 90, and when the lens, I'm sorry, rotated 90 degrees, we have doubled this patient's astigmatism. And this patient is very unhappy. So even though I typically would rather go back closer to, um, you know, maybe closer to two weeks. So the bag has had a little more chance to uh, contract. Uh, I saw this at post-op day one, that the lens had rotated this much. And, you know, we kind of came back and we scheduled the repositioning at a week, uh, confirmed the refraction, and then had her go to the surgery center. And then I rotated. So very easy to rotate it then. But I think many of us, it's just the logistics, you know, by the time we get the patient back and scheduled, it's not going to be that soon. But if you have to, you can go back pretty quickly, as I did here. Uh, she was unhappy. The last case I'll show, uh, won't take too long, is showing a atopic cataract in a young patient, 49. She only needs surgery on one eye. She has an anterior uh, subcapsular cataract. Here's the astigmatism with the roll. Okay. 
we're doing at an EDOF extended depth of focus lens with the rule. So we put it in, we put the, uh, the lens at uh, axis 80. Remember my target is 80. And on post-op day one, it's right on axis 80. So I'm feeling pretty good. But uh, at her follow-up, she's saying, I think I was seeing better right after surgery than I was, am now. Well, uh, here again, it rotated um, on 90 degrees, um, almost 100 degrees. So we have doubled, we've increased her astigmatism. So um, I took her back uh, a week later and rotated the axis and it, it stayed at 80. We brought her back a week after the rotation and she was much happier. Um, she's 2030 without correction could read. It's right on axis. So uh, we thought we were fine, but then she called up two months after that and said, or uh, six weeks after that and said, I think my vision is getting blurry. Well, we didn't know, does she have PCO or does she have uh, CME? No, the lens rotated again. So the question is, what would you do now? It's rotated twice and we've already repositioned it once. So what do you do in this situation? Um, so remember now, it's rotated, uh, it, here's the axis 80, and you can see it's at axis 133. So it's amazing, isn't it, that between one and, se uh, and seven weeks after the rotation, and the rotation was three weeks after the surgery, so between four weeks post-op and 10 weeks post-op, this rotated. So I'm gonna go back in and if I rotate it again, I'm thinking it, it could just rotate again. So I'm gonna put in a capsule tension ring and see if that will help. So now I have to enlarge the incision. I have to put fiscal elastic in. And this is Bonnie Henderson's CTR. You get it from Morcher. Um, it's uh, expensive, so it's not something that you're going to use that often. But you see that it has these little notches. She designed it this way to make it easier to strip cortex after FACO when you put this in because the conventional CTR can trap the cortex. But uh, those notches make it really good to sort of keep this um, lens from turning again. Why? Why do you think it kept turning in her? She's a myope, so her eye's a little bigger. Well, the key is she had this, uh, at this atopic uh, anterior cortical cataract in just one eye, and it was her right eye, and she's right-handed. She is an eye rubber, and that's why at atopic individuals get these cataracts, and she's basically rubbing her eye and making this lens rotate. So when I finally said, you got to stop, I think you're rubbing your eye still, stop rubbing your eye. And I put in the CTR, um, we rotated it and it stayed there and it stayed there uh, ever since. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, close up here and then uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, I'm happy to, um, that's uh, my hour. I'm happy to entertain any questions uh, for as long as uh, people have them. I know it's, uh, uh, it's nighttime and you probably want to have dinner, uh, or, uh, uh, but uh, please uh, do any questions if you would like. I see there's a chat. Do you keep, do, uh, do you keep in the OR uh, CT? Okay, got it. So um, would you use a CTR for high myopes? Um, when, we did our when we did our TORIC study, we actually ha looked at who had a CTR, and we could not find that a CTR statistically improved the rotation. So I, did not, I do not routinely do it, but if the first eye rotates, I do put a CTR in the second. And with the Acrosoft, I don't bother. Our rotation rate is so low at 1.2%. But with the Symphony now, particularly if I'm only doing one eye and they live a long way, then I will 
uh, put in a CTR. Um, do I, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I'll go back here to the top. Um, yes, with toric, with corneal ectasia and stable keratoconus, that was the point I was making a little bit earlier. Um, that patient won't see as well as someone with a normal cornea, but that doesn't mean you can't give them a monofocal toric. You would not use a multifocal for sure. But um, the ectasia means, okay, um, I've heard people say you always want to make sure you have a regular astigmatism before you use a toric, and of course that's going to give you your best result. But this, these people that have a form thrust keratoconus that's stable, um, you know, I'll typically see them. They're 70, 60 years old. I know that that cornea is not going to change. It's you know, it's already naturally cross-linked. It's not going to get worse. They've been wearing glasses. They've never worn RGP, rigid contact lenses. They're not interested in doing that. And they were seeing fine with glasses. It just means instead of being 2020, they were 2030 best corrected. So I do think if you're going to put um, astigmatism in their spectacles, you might as well put it in the lens. When you put it in their spectacles, they're telling you with the refraction, subjective refraction, what's the best fit. And I can determine the best fit. Uh, that's my job is how do I determine the best fit? And that's where I'll use the Tracy and so forth. Uh, uh, someone's uh, saying they have an IOL Master 700 at the Varian. The axes are not the same. So sometimes I take the IOL. Yeah. So um, the, the best way to determine the axis is I still think the Barrett formula. And the Barrett formula uses the IOL master Ks, but it will actually vary the target when it's an oblique axis to factor in posterior corneal astigmatism. So if you were doing a T3 or a T4 and the anterior corneal axis is consistently at uh, say uh, 160, um, the Barrett formula is going to tell you 170, and that becomes my target axis. So I'm not really that familiar with Varian, whether you can override it, but what I do is for the Callisto, it, I have to input what axis I want. So if the IOL master says axis is 180, that the axis won't change to the posterior corneal stigmatism. I input the 180, but it Literally, will if it says 160 on the anterior cornea, the Barrett will say sometimes 168. It 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 it, it moves it. So I hope I answered that question. Uh, if the Callisto, um, if you, the first Purkinje image doesn't coincide with the visual center, do you manually change? Okay, um, I usually use the first Purkinje. That's pretty accurate. If the patient is fixating, um, <clears throat> what the, this question is talking about is that when you use Callisto, there's a little plus mark that um, is a passive mark of fixation. Passive meaning the um, biometer, when you took the photo, uh, the patient was fixating. So it measured where their fixation is relative to the limbal vessel landmarks and then it displays it passively. So that's very useful, for example, if the patient is illiterate or uh, they're not fixating or you know they're asleep. Uh, so you have that. But I still prefer having them fixate and using the Purkinje's. They're usually gonna overlap. If they don't, I go with the Purkinje's. Um, so I use the astigmatism fix instead of the Barrett RX but I think you can use, there's so many different methods because they're all doing the same mathematical calculation, uh, you know, calculating the best vector and whether you're using it um, within the Iowa Master program or the Tracy program, the Holiday has a program, uh, but I sort of like the astigmatism fix because I can just uh, input it. I don't need to go to the machine, you know, and I can just input it 
and calculate it uh, even at home if I want and make my decision. And then I can uh, you know, print it out and bring that. How much post-op residual stigma is acceptable for going to repositioning? So that's a very good question. And um, you know, I, I begin to think about repositioning if I'm 10 degrees off, uh, and, uh, but it, it, it depends. Uh, if you have a higher power toric, um, you're going to have more residual astigmatism uh, if you have uh, whatever, even five degrees, but certainly 10 degrees of rotation. A lower power toric, and you, you know, it's 10 degrees off and you calculate it, and sometimes it, it won't even change the, the refraction. That's why these uh, calculators are very valuable. So in that case, I'm going to say, well, it's not even worth it. Um, sometimes the patient is just so happy and they're seeing well and, you know, it's their second eye or they're old or, you know, you, so I think there are a lot of factors that go into it. Um, uh, but that's why our study, uh, and we haven't published it yet, we're writing it up, uh, is important because no one's ever looked at the repositioning rate in um, uh, multifocal or EDOF presbyopia correcting torex, and I think that shows that we have to be more aggressive. And so uh, the, the last factor is your confidence in doing the rotation. And uh, I think the advantage of the Dr. Harapriya study and our study is we're showing, you know, large numbers. I think both of us have shown seven, about 75 consecutive toric repositionings, and both of us had good results. Uh, without the need to repeatedly rotate and without complications. So I think that is important because, of course, the last thing you want is to rotate 10 degrees and have a complication. And then the final factor is can you convince the patient to have the, the procedure and how do you explain that? Uh, and, you know, usually I tell them that um, after their surgery, uh, I can basically get a better, you know, I can refract them and I can actually calculate what's the best position. And, you know, it's telling me that if I just rotate it a little bit, it can be a little bit better. So I don't have to do the operation over. In fact, I don't even need a new incision. I'm going to go through the existing incision. And there are about 30 steps to cataract surgery. And the very last step is I get the toric lens to line up where I want it. So I'm only doing the last step. And I tell them, you know, a lot of doctors wouldn't offer this to you or would just leave it. But I tell them I'm kind of a perfectionist and I, I just want everything to be perfect. And when the patient hears that, they kind of go, well, I'm glad you're a perfectionist, Dr. Chang. I'm, that's why I came to you. So that's kind of the, the type of uh, explanation I give uh, to the patient. But um, it's really easy when you have another eye to do and you tell them that uh, on the first eye. Uh, what are your pearls uh, for PXF when they have weak zonules? Okay, well, you know how the zonules are during the surgery. You, you're starting with a capsulotomy. You get a sense of that. If they have PXF, and I think there's even a slight hint of zonulopathy, I will put in a CTR. I don't put a CTR in 100% of people because as you know, some of them have uh, quite normal zonules, um, but I'll, I'll put in a CTR then. And um, I do put in torex uh, in those uh, patients, monofocal torex. I typically try not to put in EDOF or um, uh, multifocals because it can just be so, so much more difficult if that bag ever uh, wrote, uh, dislocated. So I will try to go more for mini monovision, but if they need it, then I'll put in a monofocal toric uh, that way. But, uh, you know, you don't want to leave the rexus too small. You definitely would do um, a CTR if you're using uh, a toric um, in a PXF patient. Uh, astigmatism fix is dependent on the subjective refraction. That is true. So you do need a good refraction. And if you have other issues, um, you uh, will not have that. And then you can use, if you have the eye trace, um, you know, uh, that's what Dr. Harapriya, I know, is, is using and, and used for 
um, a little more than half of the patients in her Madurai uh, study. Um, but the reason uh, we like the we, we actually like using the refraction the best uh, because everything else, remember, you're still using the anterior cornea to determine what's the ideal axis. And it doesn't always match because of posterior corneal astigmatism. Or if you have a little bit of an irregular cornea or the patient has some dry eye. So when you use a subjective refraction, you're letting the patient's brain do the best fit analysis. And you also get an idea if they're just not, if it's not a good refraction, can you trust it? Do you need to repeat it? Or then just go by your original measurements. Um, do you use the eczema laser for residual post-op? Yeah, no, uh, I would uh, rotate the lens uh, easily within two months. Um, there really isn't a good reason not to know about misalignment after two months, unless the patient really was lost to follow up. But um, I, I suppose if uh, you know the situation was they were lost to follow up, they came back six months later, uh, sure, it'd be it'd be reasonable, but I think the um, the question um, from uh, Nitin has to do with you know is there a point where it's too risky to rotate it and you say I'm not going to leave things alone and just do the eczema laser and I think that point would always exist, um, but I'm I'm aggressive about rotating in part because uh, in our practice like in most the patient paid extra for this. And uh, I think that regardless of how, um, how easy it is for them to afford it, uh, knowing what I know, if it was my eye and I, I had a toric and I know it can be rotated pretty easily. And it, let's say it was 15 degrees off. If it were my eye, I would want that lens rotated because that's the position it is for the rest of my life. And so that's why I think I'm, um, you know, I, I think uh, I'm more aggressive. I will tell you there are many American surgeons that uh, have never rotated a toric lens. I, I don't know how they can do that, but they're just so intimidated about the prospect. You know, uh, what if I mess up? This patient will be so upset or, you know, what a terrible thing. And uh, I think going back early and, and, and having the plan uh, really, really helps. If you need to, put in viscoelastic. Um, and with the role for young patients with toric calculation, well, I think uh, this question from Madhu, hello Madhu, Shakar, is uh, uh, sort of alluding to the fact that with age, there's a very slight drift uh, toward against the role of stigmatism. So um, if anything, you might be less aggressive about correcting uh, that with the rule astigmatism in it. But, you know, like everything else, our toric lenses come in increments. Like there's a, if there was a T4 and a T5, if a T5 was really the perfect lens um, and they're young, I still go with the T5 because it, Yes, maybe 30 years, 25 years from now, they would have needed a T4, but I want them to have the benefit of the proper lens power for the next 10 years, 15 years, 20. Um, and if they get against the rule drift, they're not going to get a diopter of shift. It's going to be less than half a diopter. But let's say when I calculate it, it's kind of right in between a T4 and a T5. So, you know, they need kind of like um, 2.75 instead of three, uh, so, you know, three instead of three diopters of uh, astigmatism in the lens. So then I'm going to say, well, I have to, I can't, it's right down the middle. I have to pick one or the other. I'll pick the lower power because as that patient ages, uh, they're going to lose some of that with the role of stigmatism. I have a post-op multifocal toric um, with plus a half and plus, okay, and she's very unhappy. 
Uh, I think that the eczema is a good touch up there uh, because you have some uh, a sphere and it's not that much. And, you know, the, the option would be, um, do I take out the lens and put in a new one with a different spherical power and try to end up with better alignment? And you may get the same problem. So here's an example uh, from a Nitin that I do think it makes sense to touch it up when it's that small an error and it includes spherical to touch it up with the eczema. Uh, and that's a very good point. Um, we, we did talk about CTR for myopes and for what ranges of lens. I think that's up to you. There's no harm in putting a CTR. Um, with the Acrosoft, um, again, our rate is low enough that uh, we're not doing that. Uh, and with the Symphony Toric, uh, sometimes I am uh, putting in the, um, the Symphony, uh, putting in a CTR. And I think I, I, we sort of play it by ear. Uh, but part of it is, of course, I'm very confident about my ability to rotate and my ability to uh, manage the patient so that they're not angry or unhappy. Uh, and so, uh, that's why I'm not putting a CTR on everybody. Um, I think I answered that one. I have a post-op multifocal. Uh, I answered that one, CTR. Um, what do you keep in the OR as a backup for the sulcus? In the operating room, we have three-piece acrylic monofocal lenses. It's the J&J &J, uh, Sensar AR40. Um, and uh, that's the uh, three-piece lens for the sulcus. Uh, so I don't have a backup for the, uh, the toric. I had some cases of uh, toric lenses with PCR, but we ran out of time. So maybe sometime in the future. A toric lens in a post-RKI. Very good question. Um, Post-RK, if they have a lot of incisions, they have horribly irregular corneas with a lot of aberrations. And that patient simply will not have good quality of vision unless they wear a rigid contact lens. So when I see that patient, I tell them that, and uh, hopefully they've worn a contact before or they're willing to try, but that's a patient that I would really try to get into a rigid contact lens. Now, sometimes they only had four incisions, maybe six. The topography looks pretty good, well, then I will do a toric monofocal, but I do a toric monofocal rather than a multifocal because, you know, two problems. You got the irregular cornea and you got the problem of the hitting the spherical target. Um, if they have an RK and they, uh, they have astigmatism, but they simply say, there is no way I can wear a contact lens. I was too darn uncomfortable. It was a failure. Well, again, you're going to have to either put that correction in spectacles or in the lens and I just assume put it in the lens but this is really now why uh, the adjustable lens for our practice has taken over a hundred percent of these people with RK get offered the light adjustable lens and most of them will choose that because they of course get results that are even worse than uh, late post LASIK eyes um, in the case of the bag ruptures, to reposition the primary in the bag. Yeah, I've never had that happen, but it could happen. And what you would want to do then is, because I've thought about what would I do, um, you could replace the lens with a three-piece monofocal, and then you're going to have to uh, treat that cornea perhaps with the eczema laser. Um, but usually you have an intact CCC. And if you can get the lens in the right position, you can do what's called reverse optic capture. And what you're doing then, and you do need viscoelastic now. So remember, I was doing my rotations without viscoelastic. So now I need the viscoelastic. And I would put it in the anterior chamber, and I would put it under the lens also. Why? Because I want to keep the vitreous face intact and back and i would try to pop you leave the haptics underneath the anterior capsule they're intracapsular haptics but you just try to pop the optic forward 
so it prolapses through the CCC. And that's called reverse optic capture. And that's another technique for that patient that had recurrent uh, rotation to prevent that. I showed you the Henderson CTR. You could also pop that lens up and uh, do it that way. Uh, but that's what I would do if I uh, had ruptured the capsule when I was uh, repositioning it. it. It will change if you have a high power lens, like a you know, 22 uh, or 24 or higher, uh, it will cause a slight myopic shift, but no, no more than half a diopter. Um, for a trifocal lens, yeah, uh, how much astigmatism? Uh, the highest trifocal I've done is a um, the 300, the, the Acrosoft um, uh, Panoptics T5, you know, the TFAT uh, uh, 50. Um, and usually, if they have that much astigmatism, you know, that's uh, meaning they have at least two diopters of astigmatism. I'm actually starting to think about two torex with mini monovision. You know, uh, all of these get us to the same place. And I just know that with higher amounts of astigmatism, if you're, I think the, the way I would put it is if I'm going to use a trifocal, um, I have to be extremely confident that there will not be residual astigmatism. So that means I have to have a torex that I'm confident in, and I have to be pretty confident. And if I'm not confident because the patient's got a dry eye or, you know, it's kind of a weird looking astigmatism, um, then I back off and I go with a monofocal toric and mini monovision. It's just more forgiving. How about realigning based on the uh, TK of the IOL 700 as it will take SIA into account? Well, um, it, I don't, I'm not confident that the TK changes the axis. And I, I think that all of these things you can do, um, in terms of trying to pick the new target axis for a repositioning, but I think the, the, the refraction ultimately is what we're going on because again, we're using the patient's brain. Uh, instead of trying to predict, you know, everything else is a prediction. Um, and so you may have a spherical anterior cornea and still have astigmatism. And that could be, you know, posterior corneal astigmatism or whatnot. Um, but you're sort of letting the patient choose. So um, I, I think all of these are acceptable. But the question of what I would do is I would still do the um, astigmatism fix. Um, okay, so it's basically saying we have three more minutes. Um, CTR to present, okay, and um, I, I think this will be the last question. P tips to put the CTR in to present capsule rupture. If you're going to put a CTR in, let's say you for a, a rotation, you must use viscoelastic. You never want to put a CTR in unless the capsular bag is maximally inflated. Because if there's any chance that you can get folds or wrinkles in the capsular bag, then you could um, uh, put that through. So uh, I see that uh, we are reaching our maximum at eight o'clock. So uh, these are excellent questions. Um, I'm delighted that we, uh, we uh, had uh, so many uh, people here, and I'm glad I could uh, uh, talk to you all from halfway around the world. I hope you all stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Go through this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Uh, uh, I, I have a lot of opportunity to see the perfectionist in action, but I thought uh, this discussion will really prove how perfectionist you are to several of the people who attended the session. And it's so important that we need to realign some of these patients because. Uh, uh, it's not for a day or two. No, it's going to be lifelong in their eye. So I think I think you answered uh, uh, almost all the questions and uh, it has been a very interesting discussion today. Thank you again. Stay all safe. Right. Stay home. I mean, uh, it's a, it's been a long break for you after many years. Enjoy. Enjoy this break. All right. Take care, everybody. 
Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.